PhD, uh, she's president and founder of United Poultry Concerns, a nonprofit organization that promotes the compassionate and respectful treatment of domestic fowl, including a sanctuary for chickens in Virginia. Her essays appear in Experiencing Animal Minds, Sister Species, and many other publications on the lives of animals. Karen Davidson's books include Prison Chickens, Poison Eggs, An Inside Look at the Modern Poultry Industry, More Than a Meal, The Turkey in History, Myth, Ritual, and Reality, A Home for Henny, A Storybook for Children, and Instead of Chicken, Instead of Turkey, Instead of Chicken, and Instead of Turkey, a best-selling cookbook. Karen is the National Animal Rights Hall of Fame for outstanding contributions to animal liberation. You can find her information at www.upc-online.org/karenbio.htm. Please help me welcome Karen Davis. Thank you very much. I have some, some more here of these too. Pass around to people. I don't want to just sort of send them around. So you're going to introduce me, right? Okay. Okay. I've got, well, I think I, my voice can carry pretty well, unless, okay. unless I, need, I need it for the taping. Would you prefer, do you prefer that I could hold the mic? No, you're fine. This is a pretty small room. Okay. Sure. I'm, I'm good. Okay, hi, everyone. <clears throat> Ooh. Ooh. It's not working now. Ooh. Oh. Oh. That works. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, this is Karen Davis. I'm president and founder of United Poultry Concerns, a nonprofit organization that promotes the compassionate and respectful treatment of domestic fowl, including a sanctuary for chickens in Virginia. Her essays appear in Experiencing Animal Minds, Sister Species, and many other publications on the lives of animals. Karen Davis's books include Prison Chickens, Poison Eggs, An Inside Look at the Modern Poultry Industry, More Than a Meal, The Turkey in History, Myth, Ritual, and Reality, a Home for Henny, A Storybook for Children, and Instead of Chicken, Instead of Turkey, Instead of Chicken, and Instead of Turkey, a best-selling cookbook. Karen is the National Animal Rights Hall of Fame for outstanding contributions to animal liberation. You can find her information at www.upc-online.org slash karenbio.htm. Please help me welcome Karen Davis. Thank you. Should I begin? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And uh, I'm so happy to be here today. It's been a great event so far. And I think the rest of the day is going to be great also. So I'm going to talk to you about the uh, chicken and egg and turkey industries. Uh, some of you may have stopped by my table, United Poultry Concerns, today and picked up some literature. I hope you did. If you didn't, please, after I finish my presentation, do stop by. We have lots of literature, and the reason I bring the literature is for you to take with you to read it, to learn it, and to pass it on to other people who need to be educated. You may be interested to know that our organization, United Poultry Concerns, is located on the eastern shore of Virginia, the eastern shore of Virginia and Maryland and all of Delaware represent one of the largest chicken producing areas of the country. At any given time, a half a billion chickens are sitting in dark, filthy, sunless houses awaiting slaughter at six weeks of age. And I know that here in North Carolina, the chicken industry, the turkey industry, the pig industry is huge. So some of you may have also seen, as I have seen, the trucks going up and down the road uh, with these poor birds and these pigs on their way to the slaughter plants. 
which has to be one of the saddest scenes that anybody will ever see. Imagine being sent to slaughter. Imagine being sent to slaughter, that now you're being taken to be slaughtered. So it's a very sad situation. And uh, right up the road from where we're located, there are two huge slaughter plants, uh, Purdue chicken slaughter plant, and a little farther up the road, a Tyson chicken slaughter plant. So I'm very, very close to the industry. And we actually moved to the eastern shore of Virginia in 1998 for the sake of our sanctuary for chickens. So we moved from outside Washington, DC. Um, I used to think that going down as far as Accomack, Virginia, was really going deep into the eastern shore poultry industry. But we're now in Northampton County, uh, Virginia, which is even below Accomack. And um, so now I'm really in the heart of where the industry is located, the industry of which I have written many, many articles, many uh, chapters to books. And I have written a book on the chicken uh, egg and egg industry called Prisoned Chickens, Poisoned Eggs, an inside look at the modern poultry industry, which I urge you to stop by. You have a copy with you, don't you, Ali? Here, let me, here, you've got, got two here, yeah. Um, Prison chickens, poisoned eggs. If you're interested in the history of the industry in a readable way that's fully documented, if you're a student or whether you're a parent, a student, or just a citizen, and you want to understand how this industry came into being um, in the United States and how the poultry industry became the model for all of industrial animal agriculture, how many people knew that? that it was the chicken industry particularly that became the model for all of industrial animal agriculture on the planet. Nobody knew that? Well, now you know. <laughs> Nothing to celebrate. But, uh, and it's now, now all of the uh, practices and principles of the uh, modern chicken industry are being transferred to the raising of aquatic animals in densely populated, confined aquacultures, which are really just factory farms for fish and other aquatic animals. So just to give you a brief idea of what, here's my other book, by the way. Um, I've written several books, but another book is More Than a Meal, The Turkey in History, Myth, Ritual, and Reality. And I'll just tell you very briefly, I became so interested a number of years ago in how, as, at, as the run-up to Thanksgiving every year, the news media is full of very denigrating and um, um, desensitizing articles about turkeys. How many people have ever noticed that? Making fun of them, making fun of their intelligence or their sex, sex life, or making jokes about how they're artificially inseminated all of which is extreme brutality, no, no, no different at all from just plain old rape. And anybody who's ever had their body completely at the mercy of somebody else and they were helpless to defend themselves can just imagine what it's like to be a farmed animal in that position and to have even your sex life be, be uh, perverted and, 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 and made something uh, uh, horrible and, and disgusting and ugly. And yet, when we hear about Thanksgiving as some kind of a wholesome, wholesome uh, celebration, when you learn about the artificial insemination of the turkey hens, when you learn that all the male turkeys are masturbated by teams of men who actually masturbate them and force them to ejaculate into syringes, which are then put uh, into the female turkeys, and that these turkeys are violently struggling against this procedure, which is completely alien and frightening to them. And that the whole Thanksgiving based on a turkey is based in violence. It's the opposite of wholesome. And then there's the slaughter. And I don't know how many of you know that um, these birds, after they're hung upside down in the slaughter plants, they've been starved for 12 hours maybe already. They're terrified, absolutely terrified. They're hung upside down. And then they put, uh, drag their heads up to their shoulders, their faces, their eyes, their ears, through what's called an electrified water bath stun cabinet, a big splashing 
trough, long splashing trough full of electrified salted cold water. Now, even though this stun cabinet is called a stun cabinet, it is in no way, shape, or form designed to stun the birds. Its only purposes are to immobilize the birds on the slaughter line and to paralyze them fully conscious so that their feathers will come out more easily after they're dead. So I have entire file cabinets full of information about the poultry slaughter process. In the 1990s, our organization launched and led a campaign to try to get chickens and turkeys and other birds used for food production covered by the Humane Methods of Slaughter um, Act, the, the Federal Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, which was passed into law in 1958. Back then, there were something like eight different bills introduced into the House of Representatives, all intended to include both uh, uh, poultry and livestock. I hate using that terminology, but that's the terminology, poultry and livestock. But at the last minute, um, all of the birds who represent nine out of 10 billion animals slaughtered in this country each year for food were excluded from the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. So not that they would be slaughtered humanely if they were included, it's just that they have no status whatsoever. The birds have no status within the slaughter plants. Um, they have no recognition under the law. So we, our feeling was, and my feeling continues to be, that while they wouldn't be slaughtered or treated humanely in the slaughter plants regardless, because pigs aren't and goats aren't and cows aren't, and even though they're covered, um, still it would be better that for them to be recognized as sentient beings. Because if you have something called a humane slaughter act, even if it's not truly humane and nothing humane is done to the animals so covered, the very term humane implies that it's applied to beings with feelings, beings who can experience what is being done to them, as is certainly the case in, chick as in chickens and turkeys. It used to be believed that birds were somehow less sentient, that is, uh, less sensitive than mammals, uh, there's still a feeling about water animals, that they're somehow insentient or that they don't have feelings. And yet all of the research that has been done in the past 20 years and longer has demonstrated conclusively, conclusively, that fish, chickens, turkeys, like pigs, cows, dogs, cats, and you and I, have pain receptors. that They call them nociceptors, pain receptors. They have impact receptors. They have thermoreceptors and all kinds of other nerve endings. So they're very sensitive to everything that's being done to them. If I walk up behind one of our chickens at our sanctuary and I just like touch the, her feather, her tail feather, she's immediately aware of that, just the slightest little touch. Plus their eyes see all around. They can see everywhere. They have better eyesight than we do. I was just telling somebody out at our table, chickens and probably turkeys too, see daylight an hour before we do each day, which is why roosters crow when it's still dark out, because it's not dark out for them anymore. They see the light. How many people here, they see infrared light, they see ultraviolet light. How many people here know what the native home of chickens is? Anybody know where they came from originally? Well, yes. Uh, the foothills of the Himalayan mountains and um, the South and Southeast Asia, um, the Southeast Asian tropical forests. So these are birds who come from a tropical forest environment, who have excellent hearing and eyesight, and now the majority of them are living in dark, sunless, polluted houses where they never see natural sunlight, where they're raised basically in the dark, where they're raised in a toxic waste environment, where all the joy of life has been taken away from them. And I was just having a conversation with somebody outside a minute ago who was saying, well, Ali, who's sitting right here, and he was saying how at one time he thought that how important it was to not uh, want to cause animals uh, to suffer and thought that was enough to just, I don't want to make these animals suffer anymore because I know they can suffer. But that he realized that it isn't just about not wanting to make animals suffer by eating them and, and participating in what precedes 
their appearance as corpses, but depriving them of joy, of happiness on Earth. Because these animals can feel joy and happiness. Everybody, whoever has been around chickens and turkeys, knows that they have the same desire for happiness as anybody. They enjoy luxuriating under the sun and taking their dust baths. And they're just, you can just tell when their feathers, their tail feathers are up and their eyes are bright and they're enjoying one another's company, that they have a capacity for joy and happiness. And yet, for the majority, all of that joy has been stripped away, stripped away. And now they're in alien environments that can make no sense to them, to their nature, stripped of the green world, stripped of everything that makes life worth living, and all for something that nobody needs, and that is them as a food source. I do hope that everybody who is not yet vegan, who leaves this event today, this wonderful event, this wonderful food, and all this education, I hope that everybody will decide, I'm going to be vegan. I'm going to choose an animal-free diet. That means free of animal products, and I want animals to be free. I want them to be free. Free. That's what I want. That's what animal liberation really means. Now, thank you. And by the way, I wrote a story for children called Home for Henny, which I also recommend. It's out on our table. Um, it's based pretty much on my own experience running a sanctuary for chickens since 1985. Um, and um, it kind of takes its, its theme from live uh, or um, school hatching projects, classroom hatching projects, which uh, we urge p teachers, if you're a teacher here or a parent, not to conduct or support. And we have a wonderful booklet outside uh, for teachers and parents and anybody who wants to learn more about chickens and wants some interesting activities to teach their children or their students to uh, appreciate birds in general and chickens in particular, all kinds of classroom activities and homeschool activities and so forth. Um, a lot of people, thank you, a lot of people uh, nowadays are under the uh, illusion that uh, there is an alternative to factory farming, so-called humane farming, happy meat, um, humanely raised eggs, which always kills me when I hear humanely raised eggs because you cannot humanely raise an egg or people say humanely raised beef. But you can only raise an animal. You cannot raise a piece of meat. So this is how the animals disappear into the product. And this kind of language is, in is intentional, so that people don't think animal when they think food. So we, it's very important to be aware of how language is used to seduce us and and to blind us to the realities behind the scene at the meat counter or the restaurant menu and so forth, and how we need to be alert and conscious of what's really happening. But how many people have heard the term happy meat or humane meat or eggs or beef or humanely raised poultry, most of you? Well, I do want to give you just some basic information. I did pass out to you some literature which uh, uh, supports what I'm telling you. But about 20 years ago, there were uh, really two phenomena that began to uh, take hold as um, more and more people were learning about industrial farming and really just how, how un unwholesome, unhealthy, how bad for the environment, and of course how very bad for the animals, bad for the health, our health. And, and you know, let me just tell you this. Um, about three days ago, I was driving somewhere and listening to the Diane Rehm show on NPR, and uh, somebody called into the show and said, well, you know, they were talking about Ebola and the Ebola virus. And the woman who called in and said, oh my God, she said, you know, I go to the supermarket, she said, and I noticed that a lot of people are now, now are starting to wipe off the handle of their shopping cart before they touch the shopping cart handle because they're afraid they could pick up the Ebola virus. And this doctor who, I, whose name and words I have seen over the years, he's with the um, Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Michael Oster something or other. He was one of the guests on the show. And he said to this uh, call, uh, caller, he said, well, you know, actually, he said, we don't have to worry in this country about picking up the Ebola virus at the supermarket or anywhere else. He said, but 
you might want to wipe off the handle of your shopping cart because it might be dripping with all the salmonella from the chicken people are buying. And I was so glad he said that. You know, you almost never hear those types of truths on NPR or anywhere else. So um, we do want to be aware that one of the reasons that so many people have become concerned about industrial uh, poultry products particularly, and poultry products are the number one cause of foodborne poisoning in the world, poultry products. They're the number one cause of foodborne poisoning. I mean, we hear stories constantly about salmonella, people getting sick, people dying from salmonella po uh, food poisoning, uh, campylobacter. Uh, virtually all chickens that uh, consumer reports uh, samples from various supermarkets, whether they're high-end supermarkets or uh, average supermarkets or whatever, are loaded with campylobacter uh, intestinal bacteria. Sometimes we hear that, um, oh, there's an outbreak of uh, uh, salmonella or E. coli on tomatoes or uh, spinach or cantaloupe. Does anybody know why there's an, there's these uh, intestinal bacteria are being found on, on vegetables or fruits? Yes? Litter. The litter, and also the feathers, and different things they buy them as agricultural products to spread fertilizer and make it into crops. Right. Where the intestinal bacteria spreads them in the food. Yeah, it's the fertilizer, which has dead birds mixed in it, um, manure, everything from these well, fields. Right? Well, right, manure, poop, yeah. yes, excrement, yes. Um, also uh, from farm runoff through water, uh, leaking into uh, other places, into vegetable farms and so forth. Because intestinal bacteria uh, necessarily only grow in intestines. They do not grow and, and proliferate on uh, vegetables and fruits. So if you hear that there's an outbreak of E. coli or salmonella on cantaloupes or spinach or tomatoes or something, it's from the intestines of farmed animals. Now, the industry will tell you, oh, well, it comes from wild birds and everything. Well, that's virtually non-existent. It is the big poultry farms. That's where it's coming from. So just, just to be clear, it does not grow. These, these organisms, these bacteria do not grow on spinach or melons or, um, yes, Well, I'm going to have to continue my talk, yeah, but then no, we can I'm go. Sorry, that's, that's okay. Sorry. That's okay. But that, that's... That. Yeah, oh, I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, well, I just saw a cartoon on Facebook where it's like the doctor is telling this man, uh, you have two choices. You could either have a heart bypass and a new this put in your body and a new hookup or blah, 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 or you can choose a vegan diet. And the patient says, a vegan diet, isn't that kind of extreme? It's like, okay, well, I hope you get it. <laughs> so, but getting back to this humane farming idea, okay, so you have people concerned about industrial farming. You have this whole movement that was really very much, uh, very much inspired by Michael Pollan, uh, uh, you know, with the um, um, omnivore's dilemma about how factory farming is bad, and uh, he talks about the cruelty to animals, but, uh, but other types of animal farming are, are okay and humane. Well, how many people, for example, saw Food, Inc.? Did anybody see that movie? Well, did you see the chicken slaughter that was being done by Joel Salatin at Polyface, and how Joel, Joel Salatin said, oh, it's such a pretty day today as they're slaughtering the chickens? Well, I mean, this is not humane. And, and there was an article in, in Smithsonian last year where uh, Michael Pollan is sitting around with some uh, 
you know, upscale foodie lady, uh, my, uh, Ruth Reichel or somebody, and, you know, and they're chit-chatting at a fancy restaurant in Connecticut or something, and Michael Pollan is talking about how he couldn't wait to slaughter his chickens, he said, because they, uh, they couldn't get away from hawks. He said, like, they're so stupid, they couldn't get away from the hawks, and they were eating the produce in my garden. And he thought he was cute and funny. Well, first of all, I mean, the chickens he was talking about are the so-called broiler chickens. They're the nine of 10 animals, land animals being raised and slaughtered for food uh, in the United States, and certainly North Carolina, uh, as I said, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and elsewhere, California, Arkansas, Alabama, South Carolina. Well, these chickens have been bred to grow so large and so fast, and they have such severe skeletal problems because their skeletons can't so, they don't grow to support their body weight. So they can't get away from predators. They, they can't. That's, we've inflicted those dysfunctions upon them. And Michael Pollan is blaming the victims for being unable to get away from a hawk or a fox and saying they deserve to be slaughtered for that reason. And then because they go into his garden, well, so they deserve to die. So he couldn't put a net around his garden or something. So, I mean, he was just, just so insensitive. And Joel Salatin um, told Michael Pollan, and Michael Pollan reported this without any seeming problem, that uh, my, uh, when Michael Pollan asked Joel Salatin of Polyface Farm, which is based, by the way, in Virginia, um, um, do you have any problems slaughtering chickens? And my, Joel Salatin says, no. He said, no, because uh, animals don't have souls. Only humans have souls and are made in God's image. And I can tell you, when Joel Salatin stood at our table about three years ago at the Green Festival, where we were tabling and I was giving a talk, and he was giving a talk too, um, he came over to our table, which I was staffing, and we were showing a video of uh, uh, chickens being slaughtered at a live uh, poultry market in the Bronx. And he just stood there with a smirk on his face. Like, he enjoyed watching that. He just stood there, just watching it with a kind of smile on his face. The chickens are screaming. Um, they're writhing, and their legs are writhing in the bleed-out tunnels and holes and things. And he was just, you know, I could tell he was, he enjoyed that. He enjoyed that. He does that. And they don't have good souls, so. So, so that's it. In any case, so you've got this so-called, you know, you've got these farms which, which market themselves as alternatives to standard industrial factory farming. And then you've got the backyard chicken keeping phenomenon which has taken off where, you know, formerly municipalities that were not allowed to keep chickens in urban and suburban areas are now uh, rezoning to allow people to keep uh, the local residents to keep maybe four um, to six hens. Now, one of the results of that is that for every hen born in, in nature or in an industrial hatchery, which ironically is where they're getting these birds for the most part, so they're not really dissociating themselves from factory farming because most of these backyard chicken keepers are buying these chickens from factory farm industrial hatcheries and they're having them shipped by airmail. And the birds have the same breeding in them that was specifically done for the industrial poultry industry. So the whole idea that you're raising these birds or you're eating local is really just a myth, a sort of feel-goodism that doesn't really have anything to do with realities. So, so you have, so most of these municipalities are passing these laws that allow local residents to keep like uh, four to six hens. Well, for every hen born, a rooster is born. Well, where are these roosters? Xed, yeah, Xed out. Yes, because see, at these hatcheries, it isn't just the egg industry that destroys all the males. It isn't just the egg industry that's, that destroys all, either, either grinds up alive or suffocates um, in big plastic bags all the male chicks. The whole poultry industry does that, and including the McMurray, Murray McMurray hatcheries that send out millions of chickens and quails and ducks and turkeys every single week for cockfighting, 4-H, 
classroom hatching projects, uh, backyard chicken or turkey keeping or whatever. So these are industrial farms. And they're, they're destroying and throwing away all the males too. They're destroying them all. So when you have like a backyard chicken keeping thing operation or just a, you're keeping a few chickens, a, a, you know, again, where do the chickens come from? Nine out of 10 are coming from big industrial factory farms. The roosters are all being ground, ground up as soon as they struggle out of their eggs. They're just, they're thrown into what they call macerators, big grinding machines. As soon as they're born, I mean, just try to picture that. I mean, this is their, this is their initiation into the world. This is their initiation. Then the females are put into these dark boxes. And a lot of times, these, um, these big hatcheries, they'll throw in a few extra males, root, baby roosters, as what they call packers, packing material, because they're just going to grind them up or suffocate them anyway. So they'll use them as in place of like packing material to keep the hens warm. So then people get these birds in the mail, right, at their local post office who've been in a, Again, think about air flights. How many times are flights delayed? How many times are there connecting flights? I mean, all these things are going on, and here are these newborns, and they're in, they're, they're, they're because of, of the lobby of the polyface farm and all these so-called alternative farms, uh, together with all the cockfighters and all the other poultry users, these birds are not being shipped with any uh, attention to temperature, or anything, they're shipped exactly like luggage and canned goods. Why? To keep the price down. Even though, like the Joel Salatins of the world will say, oh, well, we care so much about these animals, just like the Tyson says that, and they all say that, you know, we care so much for our animals. They have fought successfully in Congress to prevent the airlines from carrying these birds even as cargo where there would be some minimal attention, at least, to their well-being, temperature. And um, again, the, the birds are being jostled. They're being banged around, all of this. And a lot of times, they arrive at their final destination. People don't even pick them up at the post office. The people at the post office are very upset. People at the airlines are very upset. Northwestern, a few years ago, tried to get out of the business of shipping baby birds, which the post office refers to as perishable matter. But the, um, the, the, the uh, Congress was so powerful because of this huge lobby that uh, the airlines were forced to continue to, um, and, the, and the post office supports it. So, you know. So, again, that's just sort of, again, the backstory, part of the backstory of this uh, chicken keeping idea, this poultry keeping idea, this, you know, s s now there, there are even municipalities which are trying to, at, in, like in Oakland, uh, California, and some other places, Pittsburgh, I think that died down, I, I hope so, where they want to set up their slaughter animals in, the, in cities and, and, uh, and, and, and backyards in suburban areas. Um, well, of course, then, if you go into New York City or Philadelphia or Newark or any place like that, you know, there are live poultry markets all over the place, and they're horrible places. Um, these are where the poor adult birds end up when nobody wants them anymore. Uh, backyard people, you know, they don't want the birds anymore. They have them rounded up, and they go into a live poultry market, which is just, you know, better to be dead, much better to be dead as quickly as possible than to end up finally in one of those places. And then the question is, all the ones they don't sell, whatever happens to them? What do they do with them? Oh, well, you can be sure they just break their necks and throw them in the trash or just throw them down trash chutes because that's, the, that's just the kind of world we're looking at there. Now, people hear the term free-range, cage-free, okay? How many people have heard the terms cage-free, free-range? Most, virtually everybody. Um, cage-free. Cage-free is not, in, at least in, 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 in definition, as far as definitions go. Cage-free and free-range aren't exactly the same thing. Cage-free refers to hens who are not literally raised in little wire battery cages, but they're totally confined. Cage-free means completely confined. And again, just so you know that um, free-range poultry and eggs, not all they're cracked up to be. And the booklet, uh, Life Can Be Beautiful, Go Vegan, uh, provides information. Um, documented information about all of this that I'm talking about. But um, free range means that the hens are not literally, in, or rather, excuse me, cage free, means that the birds are not literally in wire cages, which are 
totally confined. They're just totally confined. And they're very, very crowded. Uh, for example, when I and two staff people um, visited um, e uh, uh, a Black Eagle farm, an, a, a cage-free organic farm um, in Nelson County, Virginia, about two years ago, we learned about this farm because somebody by accident, dis an outsider, discovered that 25,000 hens were just being allowed to starve there, that they weren't even feeding them. So we did some further research, and uh, one result of it was that I and uh, my two staff people actually managed to get a visit with uh, one of the people who is, owns the chickens who were raised at Black Eagle, who is, uh, which is owned by somebody else. So um, when we went to see the chickens, the hens, they were, I mean, the organic hens, the so-called organic cage-free hens, they, there wasn't a bit of floor space or perch space between one hen and another. I mean, they were just a sea of birds, a sea of birds. And the perches, okay, they have perches and you think, or platforms, but you think, oh, well, that's nice. They allow the birds to get up on a platform at least, and they don't just have to stay on the floor because, of course, Chickens love to perch, and they love to get up high. They, in that nature, they go up into the trees. Um, and that's even the heavy bred chickens, the so-called broiler chickens. They make gestures. To, they want to get up. You know, they, their nature is the same inside. It's just that their bodies don't work. In any case, so, so okay, so the, the floor is just wall to wall. In this case, it was like four units, each with um, uh, 12,500 uh, hens. Uh, so-called free-range, cage-free, cage-free organic, and I think there was another that was just plain, another plain cage-free. But the point I'm making is they were all indoors, they were wall-to-wall, -wall, and the hens on the platforms just, you couldn't see anything but hens. You couldn't see anything but brown hens. And a reason that, that these so-called alternative cage-free, free-range, whatever they call themselves, uh, cage-free operations, organic operations, like to put in platforms is, do you think it's for the welfare of the hens? Does anybody know why they would like to put in platforms in addition to the floors being wall-to-wall? -wall? Anybody want to take a quick guess? Yes? They can fit more into a given volume of space, precisely. It has nothing to do with welfare. It has to do with we can put more, we have a volume of space, now we can put hens on all of the floor, and we can load them up also on perches. Good. Well, one of the things that happens is that when the hens on the perches try to jump down to the floor, they're looking for a place to land. And they can't find a place because there's nothing but hens below them, and they don't want to jump on top of each other. But let's say they try to jump eventually. Well, that's one of the reasons why they suffer broken bones and torn ligaments because they try to get an angle to, to land properly, and they can't, and then they break their bones, they, they harm themselves. Then the industry will use that as an excuse for why the hens are better off in wire cages, where, of course, nobody could ever be better off in a wire cage. Stop by my, please, table and read the uh, essay that I wrote from the point of view of a hen in a, in a battery cage which I call uh, The Life of One Battery Hen, in which I imagine myself into her psyche from the time she has her first moment of consciousness inside the incubator drawer um, to, the, to the last moment of consciousness when she dies. Um, so then you have free range. A free range means that the birds are supposed to have certifi certified access to the outdoors. So in other words, the cage-free birds don't get outdoors. They're just not in cages, but they are totally confined indoors and crowded. But the free-range birds, they're supposed to have what is called certified U.S. Department of Agriculture access to the outdoors for some portion of the day. It's, very un it's, not, it's not specified. So, so you have... Um, you have this requirement that the birds have to have some kind of certified access to the outdoors. But a lot of times, um, I have very little time left, right? A lot of times, 
there's just like a little aperture. So the hens who are way over there, they can't even reach the outdoor, you know, the place to get out. And then there's just the general, you know, when you're just, imagine if this room were just filled totally with us, wall to wall. I mean, what happens to your spirit under those conditions? What happens to your, your desire to do things, to even do anything, you know? Because there's nothing really you can do. You're just kind of stuck there. So then the, then the farmers all complain, well, if we let the birds go outdoors, then they're going to lay their eggs here and there, and we can't control the eggs, and we have to waste time you know, trying to find the eggs and everything. So what the US Department of Agriculture and the industry, the so-called alternative, which is really just another part of the factory farming industry, has done is they have used bird flu as an excuse to keep the, cage, the, the free range hens locked up as much as possible. They say, well, a wild bird could be flying overhead, and then if there was a dropping that had like a bird flu uh, virus in it, then all the birds could become infected. So they're better off being kept indoors. So I mean, that's just a scam. It's just a scam. So these are just some of the realities of the so-called alternative, um, alternative uh, production methods. There's a lot of rhetoric which sounds, you know, positive and pretty. And if you go to some of these websites, you think, oh, these like Black Eagle, oh, their pictures have nothing to do with how they actually keep their chickens. Nothing. It's like these are just pictures they could have snapped, you know, anywhere. <laughs> and, or they could have photoshopped them into just put in pretend grass or something, you know, uh, which they probably did. And, uh, and, and because the reality of how those, that is an example, that Black Eagle farm in, in uh, Nelson County, Virginia, it, it, it's just typical. And then I could tell you the whole story about how the uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture, right before Christmas, they just had all these millions of emails going back and forth that we got through Freedom of Information Act requests. Uh, joking, laughing, oh, I mean, no feeling, no, no feeling, none, none, zero for these poor hens. They just laughed and talked about how they were going to wait to depop them until after Christmas. In other words, depopulate them. Send them down to North Carolina to be slaughtered. Um, these are just the realities. So I know that the time is already over, and I'm sorry I didn't give a, have a chance to answer your questions, although a couple people did get a chance to speak. And if you come, please, by my table, I'll be glad to talk with you. And uh, again, I urge you to take the literature and buy the books, and thank you for coming.